Hi, it's Katrina. African Cichlid It's understandable, natural even, that parents want to keep their children safe from danger, but the African Cichlid takes protective parenting at least one step beyond the norm. African Cichlids are mouth brooding, meaning that a female will lay the eggs in the nest for the male to fertilize. Then she scoops them up with her mouth where they remain until they hatch, between 10 and 15 days after fertilization. Once the babies are born, they remain in the mother's mouth for up to two more weeks, only leaving to feed. When danger threatens, the vigilant mother sucks them back inside. How many eggs a mother carries depends on her age and reproductive maturity. While new mothers carry around 10 eggs, more experienced mamas will have up to 30 eggs in their mouths. Males are extremely eager to mate, according to Stanford researchers who study the African cichlid's reproductive process. You'll know this if you have them in an aquarium but they play no role in parenthood and may even eat the babies if they are around when the mother releases them, so she better be careful. Longest Brooding Period Several years ago, researchers at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute began observing a female deep-sea octopus off the central California coast. For four and a half years, they watched her guard her eggs roughly 4,600 feet below the water's surface. It's the longest known brooding period of any animal, during which she kept the eggs clean and protected them from predators. For many female octopuses, laying eggs is the beginning of the end. They stop eating and waft currents of water over the eggs to make sure they get enough oxygen so she never leaves them alone. Before this, biologists didn't know how long this brooding period lasted until the team found this mother octopus with their sub. The scientists who kept an eye on the deep-sea mother-to-be for nearly five years never witnessed her eating throughout their 18 dives, and they saw her push away crabs and shrimp that came too close. They even tried offering her food using a robot arm, but she turned them down. It's possible that she occasionally snagged a bite, but they never saw it. Over time, she began wasting away, and the researchers noticed her losing weight and her skin becoming loose and pale while her eyes were cloudy. They witnessed her for the last time in September 2011. The octopus was gone the next time the scientists went to check on her. Her eggs had all hatched and just their remains were proof of her lengthy presence there. In total, she spent 53 months making her the record holder for the longest brooding period and the epitome of parental sacrifice. To learn more, you can watch a mother octopus on the BBC series Life. Centipede Who would have thought about centipedes, right? At first glance, there is nothing remarkable about centipede reproduction. Like many insects, most of them lay eggs. However, some species do have live births. Most male centipedes will perform a little mating dance to impress the female. They produce a spermatophore for the female to take or simply leave it behind for her to find. Females lay between 10 and 60 eggs depending on the species. Some species will actually curl around their eggs or sit on them to guard them closely. Who knew, right? The mom will protect them from predators and lick them to remove mold spores until they hatch. Depending on the circumstances, the mother-to-be might abandon or even eat her own eggs. Remember, nature is rough. But when things go according to plan, she often stays with the baby centipedes until after they hatch and start to disperse. The little hatchlings are miniature versions of adults. They don't have all of their legs, but gain them as they grow. Naked Mole Rat This creature just keeps coming up for so many reasons. They have super weird teeth that move like chopsticks, they are clearly quite ugly, and they do not feel pain. But it gets even weirder. The queen of a naked mole rat colony is its only reproductive female, like a queen bee. She does not inherit her position at the top. Instead, she seizes the throne by force, a la Game of Thrones, by killing the current queen and taking her place. As soon as she becomes queen, she begins birthing litters like crazy, with each being larger than the next. This happens because unlike all other mammals, the naked mole rat's bones continue growing after it reaches adulthood. With each pregnancy, the space between the queen's vertebrae and spine, known as the intervertebral disc space, grows slightly. The earliest litters number between 10 and 15 offspring. Over time, a single litter can include as many as 33 pups, more than any other mammal in the animal kingdom. And you thought rabbits reproduce fast. Nope. Then there can be many more of these mole rats running around. Aren't you excited? Egg-laying mammals Duck-billed platypuses are an ancient mammal known as a monotreme and one of two mammals who lay eggs as opposed to giving birth. A female platypus burrows and seals herself into an underground tunnel on the riverbank when she's ready to have offspring. There, she lays one of two eggs. To keep them warm, she stores them between her rear end and tail. 
The eggs hatch bean-sized babies about 10 days later, and for the next three to four months, the babies wean, learning how to swim on their own in the meantime. Monotremes and their relatives were once not only common, but were Australia's dominant mammals. They were nearly wiped out after the arrival of marsupials, or pouch-bearing animals like kangaroos and their ancestors, between 71 and 54 million years ago. The echidna, which also lives in Australia, is the only other egg-laying mammal on Earth besides the platypus and is the world's oldest surviving mammal. A virgin birth In December 2001, a female hammerhead shark gave birth at the Henry Dorley Zoo in Omaha, Nebraska. The miraculous thing was that there were no male members of her species in the tank, and she hadn't been near a male hammerhead in over three years. So how did this happen? At first, researchers assumed she'd mated with a tank mate of another species, or used sperm that was stored in her body from a very long time ago, which female sharks are capable of doing, although usually not three years later. But a subsequent DNA analysis showed that her baby contained no male DNA. This is called parthenogenesis. This is the phenomenon of a female animal reproducing without mating. It happens with various creatures and in most vertebrate lines, including some snakes and lizards, but not mammals. However, this was the first recorded instance of it happening with a shark or a cartilaginous fish. During the cell division process that normally creates an egg, the creature's genetic material combines. The offspring therefore possesses two copies of half the parent's chromosomes, making them a half clone. The Belle Isle Aquarium in Detroit later reported observing parthenogenesis among their white bamboo sharks. The phenomenon wasn't scientifically proven, but Dr. Mahmoud S. Shivji, director of the Guy Harvey Research Institute and the author of a study about the hammerhead shark, told the New York Times that it's reasonable to assume that parthenogenesis is more widespread among different shark lineages. It's a last resort tactic that animals use when they absolutely can't find another mate, according to Dr. Robert E. Huter, the director of the Center for Shark Research at the Moat Marine Laboratory in Sarasota, Florida. While this last-ditch strategy may prevent a species from extinction, it is also not a viable long-term plan, as it leads to a lack of genetic diversity. Pretty fascinating, just the same. Baby Carrying Males The seahorse is the only creature that truly experiences a male pregnancy. Its procreative process begins with a couple of seahorses dancing in the morning as a way to gauge one another's reproductive quality while clinging to underwater vegetation and intertwining their little tails. This eventually leads to an eight-hour-long courtship dance during which the female puts eggs into the male's brood pouch. Once the eggs are in the male's pouch, he fertilizes them. As the eggs grow, the father regulates the water salinity within his pouch so that his babies are born ready for their marine life. Then, after a 10 to 25 day pregnancy, depending on the species, the eggs hatch as the father has contractions, and he gives birth to up to 2,000 baby seahorses. Once the fry or baby seahorses are born, they're on their own. Neither parent affords them any protection or guidance as they navigate their way through the seas. Between being eaten by predators and swept away by sea currents, roughly 5 out of every 1,000 fry survive into adulthood. That's why they need to have so many. There are around 40 seahorse species, all belonging to the hippocampus genus, who inhabit tropical and temperate coastal waters worldwide. They range from less than an inch to almost a foot in length. One Big Egg New Zealand's kiwi bird lays the largest egg in proportion to its body size of any bird on Earth, with one egg amounting to about a quarter of the mother's weight. This flightless avian species is about the size of a chicken, yet its egg is around 10 times the size of a chicken egg and it lays up to 100 of them annually. There is an advantage to laying such a large egg. Its yolk is big and provides ample nutrition, leading to a well-developed chick. What this amounts to is a very independent baby, and less energy invested on the mother's behalf into raising them once they're born. Another possible reason that the kiwi bird's egg is so big is because the bird may have once been as large as its ancestors, the emu and the ostrich. Through evolution, the kiwi bird became smaller, but its egg remained the same size. Dolphins Unlike many mammals and other creatures, dolphins lack a designated breeding season. They can reproduce at any time with little rhyme or reason to the process. The gestation period is kind of long, roughly a year, after which a 25 to 40 pound, 4 foot long calf is born tail first underwater. The mother immediately pushes her newborn to the surface for oxygen. From there on out, the calf instinctively swims alongside its mother in what's known as the echelon position, enabling it to keep up with her without exerting much effort, and while simultaneously nursing multiple times daily. Somehow they manage to feed without any water getting sucked in, 
and these newborns also learn how to use their blowhole by judging an appropriate distance to the water's surface for air. Aw, so cute. Calves nurse for between one and three years while being introduced to other food sources in the meantime, like fish and squid. Dolphins have many different partners. Male dolphins are typically not very direct toward females about their attraction, but can become more aggressive in their advances if she fails to initially show interest. Males eagerly combat and warn one another when it comes to females, and the whole thing can get pretty intense. A Standing Delivery After a 14-15 to 15 month pregnancy, a female giraffe delivers a 100-150 to 150 pound, 6 foot tall calf. Usually the baby's hooves exit first, followed by its nose and head. On average, labor takes just 30 to 60 minutes total. The little one's drop from their mother's womb to the ground is also about six feet high. As painful as it might sound as the baby thuds against the ground, this fall helps break the umbilical cord, ruptures the amniotic sac, and encourages the calf to take its first breaths. The mother immediately cleans her baby after it falls to the ground, and right after that, the newborn begins attempting to walk. Within an hour of being born, a calf will stand on their own and take their first steps. Less than a day later, they'll be running like a pro. They better, otherwise the lions will try to get them and they have to be able to get away fast. Female giraffes are creatures of habit when it comes to childbearing and will often return to the same place repeatedly to give birth. These sites are known as calving grounds and often remain the same throughout several generations, meaning a mother giraffe may deliver her offspring at the same place where she was born. The Bullet Ant the bullet ant is widely known as the insect with the most painful sting, which is often compared to being shot with a bullet, hence its name. It's also commonly called the 24-hour ant in Venezuela because the sting's effects typically wear off after a day. This species inhabits tree bases in Central and South America's tropical forests. At up to 1.2 inches long, it's one of the biggest ants in the world. It has a visible stinger and an oversized mandible, which it uses for latching onto its victims. However, it is called the bullet ant for a reason, because it feels like you got hit by a bullet. Getting stung is traumatic in its own right, simply because of how excruciating it is. The bullet ant's intense sting is 30 times more painful than a honeybee sting and is often described as electric. An offended ant will repeatedly strike their target over and over, injecting venom that contains a neurotoxin called planerotoxin, which causes burning, swelling, and uncontrollable shaking, in addition to the unbearable pain. Indigenous people get stung by these ants a dozen or more times during puberty rites and do not suffer long-term effects. Boys as young as 12 must put their hands inside gloves containing bullet ants at least 20 times before they can be considered a man and a warrior. People have put this ant sting to the test on purpose in several documentaries, and it never ends well. Despite their fearsome reputation and top-ranking position on the Schmidt Pain Index, which measures the human pain of insect stings, bullet ants are typically only aggressive when provoked, and their venom is usually only life-threatening to allergic individuals. To stop the pain, you must wait out the 24 hours and maybe have a drink. The Electric Eel the electric eel is not actually an eel. It's a member of the knifefish family that dwells in Amazonian fresh waters and is named after its frightening ability to generate an electrical charge. It grows from 6 to 8 feet long and weighs as much as 44 pounds. In a video that went viral several years ago, a fisherman recorded an electric eel zapping a caiman and essentially electrocuting the crocodilian to death. Electric eels can release around 600 volts of electricity, which is enough to temporarily incapacitate a human. If this happened in the water, it could easily lead to drowning. Being shocked more than once can cause someone to stop breathing or send them into heart failure. Researchers aren't entirely sure how the electric eel can deliver a sometimes fatal shock without feeling the effect of it themselves, but there are several theories, including that the creature has a built-up resistance to its own charge. It also appears to deliberately channel its electrical powers by triggering its three electrocyte-producing organs at whim. Like with several creatures here, an electric eel shock can be fatal to humans, but recorded instances and attacks in general are extremely rare. Not that many people are out swimming and tubing with electric eel. Red-bellied piranha Red-bellied piranhas are named after, as I'm sure you can guess, their red undersides. What their name fails to warn people of is their jaw full of razor-sharp triangular teeth, which enables them to bite down with great force and shearing ability. These fish live in still and moving low-elevation parts of the Amazon River Basin, where they grow up to 4 feet long and weigh as much as 4 pounds. 
This species is considered one of the more dangerous and aggressive piranhas to humans out of the 40 or more species found throughout the region. While many, if not most, piranha species are omnivorous or even herbivorous, often preferring seeds over meat, the red-bellied piranha is best known for attacks on humans. This mostly happens during the dry season because the fish are hungry. Water levels are lower and food is scarce, making them more prone to targeting people, especially those splashing around and making a lot of noise. But even this is rare and in most cases, red-bellied piranhas don't attack humans. Attacks are usually non-fatal, but can cause damage to the hands, feet, or whatever other body parts the fish decide to take a bite from. Brazilian Wandering Spider Also called arm spiders or banana spiders, Brazilian wandering spiders belong to the Phonutria genus, which means murderous in Greek. There are eight species total, which are all found in Brazil, and some of which occasionally dwell in other places, such as Argentina and Costa Rica. They are hairy and up to two inches long, with leg spans measuring up to six inches. These nocturnal ambush and attack predators favor wandering the forest floor in search of prey and do not build webs. As one of the world's deadliest spiders, their venom can easily kill a human. The Brazilian wandering spider often appears aggressive since they will raise their two front legs when they feel threatened. However, it is usually defensive in nature. Just like other creatures, they respond to threats by first giving a warning for the enemy to get away, or it will bite you if necessary. Of course, it's possible to accidentally trigger a Brazilian wandering spider and receive a dose of its venom containing toxins, proteins, and peptides which attack chemical receptors of the neuromuscular system. Initial bite effects include sweating, burning pain, and goosebumps. Within a half hour, symptoms escalate to vertigo, blurred vision, high or low blood pressure, elevated or decreased heart rate, convulsions, and shock. Men can get painful erections that can lead to impotence. Scientists are currently setting the venom for use in various types of medical treatments. But good news is, spiders usually won't unload their entire venom supply because this makes them vulnerable to predators and less capable of effectively attacking prey. Regardless, people who are bitten by a Brazilian wandering spider should seek medical attention immediately. Amazonian Giant Centipede also known as the Peruvian giant yellow-legged centipede, the Amazonian giant centipede lives in tropical and subtropical rainforest habitats throughout the Caribbean and South America. It's one of the world's largest centipedes, growing up to nearly a foot long. While the Amazonian giant centipede is a fast mover and won't hesitate to flee when threatened, it's also capable of being very aggressive, especially in its pursuit for food. It's a carnivore with an indiscriminate diet, feasting on a range of insects and vertebrates including frogs, mice, lizards, snakes, birds, and even bats. This creature seizes prey by using its two sharp forcipules, which are located on its head, to inject its victim with a highly toxic venom and then shred into them. The Amazonian giant centipede's venom easily kills small prey, but is rarely lethal to humans. It is, however, extremely painful, accompanied by symptoms like swelling, pain, redness, chills, fever, nausea, and weakness. Because of the species' reclusive lifestyle, it rarely bites humans, and the only fatal cases involve extenuating circumstances such as bites to the esophagus. South American Rattlesnake The South American Rattlesnake is a highly venomous pit viper subspecies native to Brazil, where it's responsible for roughly a tenth of all snake envenomations. It's found throughout most of South America and not limited to the Amazon. This slithering serpent is well camouflaged and therefore difficult to spot, and most people are bitten when they unintentionally step on one. An accidental encounter can mean being injected with the snake's myotoxic, neurotoxic, and hemotoxic venom. In other words, the venom destroys tissue, attacks the nervous system, and causes internal bleeding and severe pain. A life-saving antivenom exists, but because people are often bitten far from available medical treatment, several die every year from South American rattlesnake bites. The Jaguar As South America's largest big cats, it's no wonder jaguars are considered dangerous. They were once widespread throughout South America and as far north as the southern U.S., but are now endangered and are only found in parts of Central and South America, particularly the Amazon River Basin. Jaguars typically measure between 43 and 75 inches long and weigh up to 250 pounds. With one of the most impressive bite strengths among all big cats, including lions and tigers, a jaguar can easily pierce through a human's bones or crack a sea turtle's shell. In fact, it can more or less effortlessly seize most creatures in its habitat and even prefers large prey, including reptiles and livestock, which speaks to its terrifying strength. Attacks on humans are rare, but often fatal. 
Yet, as capable as jaguars are of shredding humans, we're more of a threat to them than they are to us, as evidenced by their fragmented and dwindling populations at the hands of deforestation. Jaguars are also killed by fearful farmers and ranchers intent on protecting their livestock. Perhaps the lesson to be gained here is that even the most optimal physique and evolutionary advantages cannot protect an animal from human destruction, even if it could easily take a person out in a one-on-one -on -one battle. The Green Anaconda The Green Anaconda is the world's largest snake by its sheer weight. It can exceed 29 feet in length and measures up to a foot in diameter, while often weighing more than 550 pounds. This species dwells in the freshwater streams, ponds, marshes, and swamps of the Amazon. It's non-venomous and uses its size and strength to its advantage by constricting its prey, overwhelming their circulatory system in the process, and preventing blood from reaching the brain. Another way it kills its victims is by constricting them in the water, causing them to drown. The green anaconda's diet consists of sizable animals, including wild pigs, deer, and even jaguars. This skilled swimmer spends most of its time completely submerged, lurking for unsuspecting victims who approach the water for a drink. While attacks on humans are rare and there are few reported cases, green anacondas are easily capable of greatly harming a person, or worse. There are no verified instances of one actually eating a human, although it could happen since they eat stronger creatures. Luckily, researchers believe that the snakes do not encounter people often enough to consider them desirable prey. Herpetologist Jesus Rivas, who founded the Anaconda Project, pointed out in an interview in 2016 that two researchers who were attacked by green anacondas had spent a great deal of time near them, and the snakes were therefore abnormally exposed. The lesson to be learned here? Don't bother a green anaconda, and it probably won't bother you. The Black Cayman Black caimans are semi-aquatic reptiles of the Alligatoridae family and are distributed throughout much of South America, especially the Amazon basin. They're the largest of six Amazon caiman species, with adult males reaching an average length of 13 feet, although there are unconfirmed reports of the specimens measuring up to 20 feet. These massive reptiles, who can easily weigh 1,000 pounds, are not picky eaters. They'll feast on anything from fish to reptiles, rodents, and capybaras, which grow up to four feet long. On occasion, they even target deer, dogs, and pigs. Black caimans are responsible for at least a handful of predatory assaults on people throughout South America. They typically only target humans under unusual circumstances, like during seasonal flooding, which brings the species into closer proximity to people. They are also especially aggressive during mating season. As a general rule, it's best to keep as much of a distance from black caimans as possible, as they're plenty strong enough to greatly damage humans, especially small children, although most attacks on the Amazon are against fishermen. As an apex predator, they also lack the fear instincts that cause prey animals to flee from perceived threats, resulting symptoms of an attack such as physical trauma, blood loss, and secondary infections, which occur during or after treatment for other infections, can ultimately be fatal. Between January 2008 and October 2013, there were 43 black caiman attacks on humans. Less than one-fifth of them resulted in death. Poison Dart Frog The vibrantly colored poison dart frog family is comprised of many species which are native to Central and South America. Many spend most of their time on the Amazon floor near freshwater bodies, while others live in trees and practically never come down. They are small, with the largest specimens measuring just 2.4 inches long and brightly colored. Humans may think of them as pretty, but in the natural world, a poison dart frog's vivid shading is meant as a warning that they are poisonous and to stay away. A good rule of thumb is the brighter a poison dart frog is, the more poisonous it is. The most toxic species in the family is the golden poison dart frog, which contains enough poison to kill up to 10 adult humans. Meanwhile, some species and captive specimens aren't toxic at all. Generally speaking, poison dart frogs are poisonous, but not deadly. They gain their toxicity in the wild by consuming insects who eat poisonous plants, such as ants, centipedes, and termites, and the frogs carry this poison in their skin and bodies. Unlike snakes and other venomous animals, who usually have to bite someone for any real damage to occur, it's terrifyingly easy for a poison dart frog to spread its ill effects to other creatures. Lethal or not, the poison dart frog's poison is often very effective, which is why indigenous hunters once used them for making hunting darts. Different frogs' poisons are made up of different chemicals, which is why they vary in their capacity to harm or kill humans and other creatures. Symptoms of coming into contact with the infamous golden poison dart frog include swelling, paralysis, 
nausea, and perhaps even death, proving that it's best to simply avoid these creatures altogether, regardless of species. Valuable Vomit when eight-year-old Charlie Naismith discovered an odd gray rock while walking along a beach with his father in Dorset, UK in 2012, he had no idea he had just stumbled onto a potential small fortune. The strange substance turned out to be something called ambergris. According to National Geographic, sperm whales eject an intestinal slurry called ambergris into the ocean where it hardens as it bobs along. Researchers disagree on what part of the whale's body ambergris comes from. In fact, its origins in general were unknown until the 19th century, even though people have been using ambergris for centuries. Most people think it's vomit. Nicknamed floating gold, this unpleasant substance is worth a lot of money. The high-end fragrance industry uses ambergris because of its musky aroma. I wonder who figured that out? I mean, who picked it up and said, gee, I wonder if this will smell better later? When removed from the whale, it has been described as possessing a strong fecal smell, said writer Emily Osterloff from the UK's Natural History Museum website. But the scent is said to be more pleasant once the mass dries out. There you go. Ambergris can sell for thousands of dollars per ounce, depending on if the nose or the person responsible for choosing perfume scents likes the smell. The chunk of ambergris that little Charlie Naismith discovered weighed over a pound and has an estimated potential value of $63,000. Ambergris is banned in the U.S. due to the sperm whale's endangered status, which likely comes as welcome news to any Americans out there who feared that they were spritzing themselves with stomach secretions but it's commonly used in France and several other foreign markets. Supergiant Crustacean This guy gives a whole new meaning to the term jumbo shrimp. Alicella gigantea is a supergiant crustacean that grows over 20 times larger than most of its relatives, who are usually less than a half inch long on average, so small that they carry the nickname insects of the sea. Humans have only witnessed these creatures up close a handful of times. In 2011, a group of scientists trapped seven Alicella gigantea specimens four miles beneath the water's surface in the Kermadec Trench off New Zealand's northeastern coast. The largest among them measured 11 inches long. Not only do these creatures look strange like giant pale shrimp, they actually don't feel real, expedition leader and University of Aberdeen lecturer Alan Jameson told Our Amazing Planet. They feel like plastic toys. They have a waxy texture to them. But the question is, are they tasty? Additionally, a deep-sea camera captured nine more of the unusually big amphipods. The researchers were unsure why there were so many of them in the area. Even more oddly, when the team returned the following week, they were all gone something Jameson referred to as very, very strange. The Maid of Harlech In 2007, a family was walking along a beach in Wales when they spotted something quite unexpected, an entire airplane partially exposed in the water. It was a World War II-era American fighter plane called the Maid of Harlech, poking out of the sea along a North Wales beach. Can you imagine finding a whole airplane while you're going for a swim? Piloted by 24-year-old 2nd Lieutenant Robert F. Elliott, the Lockheed P-38 Lightning aircraft crash-landed on September 27, 1942. Its left engine lost power less than an hour into Elliott's flight. While attempting an emergency landing, the right engine also malfunctioned and the plane landed in two feet of water. But good news is, Elliott survived without a scratch. The case didn't receive much publicity, however, if any. At the time, UK beaches were closed to the public and the press was banned from discussing any disasters. There is no evidence that any visitors encountered the wrecked plane after beaches reopened, and the authorities have always kept its location hush-hush to prevent people from disturbing it. Wherever it is, the family sure did find it, but they haven't said exactly where it was. Plus, the plane is usually covered by sand and water. While the aircraft's guns have been removed, it still carries its fuel load. The Maid of Harlech was not seen again until the 1970s when it became partially uncovered from the six and a half feet of sand that normally covers it. This happened again in 2007 and in 2014. If you're hoping to get an up-close glimpse of this World War II relic, good luck finding it in the first place. Not only would you need perfect timing in terms of shifting sands and waters, its precise location remains a secret. In 2014, local aviation historian Matt Rimmer spent 120 days ensuring the plane's safety. The plane is covered by the Protection of Military Remains Act, but looting is still a problem. It's shout-out time! Big thank you to Anna Garcia from the Philippines and Shweta Chavan from India. Thanks so much for your nice comments and support. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the Origins Explained family. Purple Blob 
A team of scientists aboard the research vessel EV Nautilus discovered a bizarre purple blob off the Southern California coast in 2016. They found the bright jelly sack, which appeared to be just a few inches in diameter, with the help of a deep-sea remote-operated vehicle, or ROV, that was combing the ocean floor. After failing to identify it by looks alone, the researchers brought it aboard and determined that it constitutes a previously undiscovered life form. It could take scientists years to figure out exactly what it is. The perplexed team jokingly nicknamed the object, or creature, or whatever it is, Blobus purpilus. On a serious note, one hypothesis holds that it's a type of marine invertebrate called a tunicate. Another possibility is that the blob is an egg sac. But for now, the general consensus is that it's so weird, your guess is as good as mine. Sargasso Sea the Sargasso Sea is the only sea that contains no land boundaries. It's defined exclusively by four ever-changing ocean currents, meaning its borders constantly shift. This water body is located within a large system of rotating currents called the Northern Atlantic Subtropical Gyre. To the west is the Gulf Stream, while the North Atlantic Current defines the sea's northern boundary. The Canary Current is eastward, and the North Atlantic Equatorial Current marks the southern border. You got that? The Sargasso Sea is named for Sargassum, a genus of free-floating seaweed that reproduces on the high seas rather than the ocean floor, unlike most other seaweeds who reproduce and start life at the bottom. An individual strand of this unique plant can grow as long as a school bus, and strands become interwoven to form large floating mats often measuring several football fields long. Sargassum's presence attracts diverse wildlife, including various threatened and endangered eels, along with white marlin, dolphinfish, and poor beagle shark. The sea also serves as an important migrating region, providing creatures on the go with much-needed food. Like a cafe! Pink Manta Ray Australia is famous for its incredibly diverse and often strange and dangerous wildlife, as you know. While free diving off the Great Barrier Reef in 2015, photographer Christian Leanne snapped a picture of a bright pink manta ray. He was looking through his camera when the creature initially swam by, causing the man to believe his equipment was malfunctioning. But much to his surprise, he was seeing correctly. Lane wasn't wrong to question his vision, however. The beautiful marine animal that he was lucky enough to witness firsthand is the world's only known pink manta ray. He appropriately nicknamed it Inspector Clouseau after the detective from the Pink Panther movies and posted an image on Instagram which quickly went viral. Inspector Clouseau has been spotted less than 10 times since then. Researchers first speculated that a skin infection or the manta ray's diet caused its unique hue, similarly to how flamingo's intake of tiny crustaceans influences its vivid pigmentation. But Project Manta researcher Amelia Armstrong ruled out both these causes following a 2016 biopsy. The current prevailing theory suggests that a genetic mutation that affects the expression of melanin is responsible for Inspector Clouseau's rosy color. It could be a condition called erythrism, which causes an animal to be reddish or pink. What do you think? A pink manta. Pretty cool, right? Thousands of rubber duckies. In 1992, a shipping crate en route from Hong Kong to Seattle fell overboard and spilled 28,000 plastic rubber duckies into the Pacific Ocean. They've appeared all over the world since then and continue to do so. Nicknamed friendly floaties, the ducks have shown up on the shores and waters of Hawaii, Alaska, South America, Australia, Scotland, and Newfoundland. They've even been discovered frozen in Arctic ice. The friendly floaties gained worldwide fame along with their travels, even inspiring author Eric Carle to write a children's book called Ten Rubber Ducks. Perhaps more importantly, the myriad of plastic bath toys also captured the attention of oceanographer Curtis Ebsmeyer, who began tracking their whereabouts. The information offered valuable insight regarding ocean currents as Ebsmeyer spent more than two decades following the ducks. Confirmed sightings by others continued until the mid-2000s. Additionally, the friendly floaties decades-long and far-reaching presence throughout the world's waterways alerted researchers and civilians alike to the important and alarming issue of plastic pollution. By tracking their paths, it became apparent that floating rubbish can travel much farther than anyone ever realized. Other researchers began following the travels of various drifting objects, with some employing the assistance of sophisticated satellite technology. What we know now, other than the terrifying reality that pollution is taking over the world's oceans, is that there are six major plastic garbage patches. Moreover, the migration of debris from one body of water to the next is highly interconnected, challenging previous long-held notions about their movement. Thousands of holes. Last year, researchers from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute announced the discovery of thousands of strange holes in the seabed off the coast of Big Sur, California. 
The first of these pits were discovered in 1999 during a seafloor survey, according to a statement MBARI released, revealing the strange news. Over the following years, scientists found thousands of more holes. The largest among them, called pockmarks, measure 600 feet across and 16 feet deep on average. They're described in the statement as nearly circular and fairly evenly spaced. Altogether, there are more than 5,200 pockmarks covering a 500 square mile area. The cause and persistence of the pockmarks still remains a mystery, but we find no evidence that they were created from gas or fluid in the seafloor in the recent past, MBARI researchers Eve Lundson and Charles Paul explained. Scientists also discovered over 15,000 smaller holes called micro-depressions, which measure on average 11 feet across and 3 feet deep. That's pretty big for micro. These were called recently formed erosional features. So far, that's about all they know about these really weird holes. What do you think these holes are? Let me know in the comments below. Globsters By definition, a globster is an unidentified organic mass that washes ashore. Unlike a recognizable beached carcass, it resembles an alien-like ancient-looking or otherwise unknown sea creature and lacks distinctive features such as eyes and bones. Globster sightings often give way to controversy and far-flung theories about what the creature really is. But the more trained eyes of the scientific community usually put rumors and speculation to rest by offering more rational explanations. Most globsters are ultimately identified as whales, large sharks, or other realistic species. Their strange appearances are simply the result of the decomposition process an animal's remains go through after it dies. But many strange spines, beaks, and freakish critters remain unidentified. The term globster arose in 1962, courtesy of British biologist Ivan T. Anderson, who used it to describe a mysterious carcass that washed ashore in Tasmania two years earlier. Not a monster, but a globster. Another famous globster known as the Chilean blob appeared on the beach in July 2003. Many people believed that the 13-ton, 41-foot mass was a sea monster because it looked like nothing they'd ever seen before. The following year, scientists identified it as highly decomposed sperm whale remains. Similar corpses have turned up virtually all over the world, with each accompanied by its own unique version of local hysteria. In the Philippines, for example, many people believe there is a correlation between globsters and earthquakes. The relatively frequent sightings of globsters indicate that they are truly nothing out of the ordinary, but there is always more to the story, and it's hard to say what the creature once was. Boiling Siberian Sea In October 2019, a scientific research team discovered boiling methane bubbles in the eastern Siberian Sea. The fountain, which occupied an area between 43 and 54 square feet, had a gas concentration measuring six to seven times higher than the global average. In an expedition to study the effects of thawing permafrost beneath the ocean, the team traveled to an area that produced methane fountains long ago. But they didn't necessarily expect to see any active ones, let alone any with bubbles large enough to scoop out with buckets. Permafrost stays frozen for up to tens of thousands of years at a time and is not exclusive to land. It exists underwater, which explains the recent discovery of methane bubbles in the sea. When it melts, the organic material contained within breaks down and releases methane. This is concerning because as more permafrost thaws, more methane is released into the atmosphere, which leads to more warming in a world that is already threatened by the potential effects of climate change and approaching historically high global temperatures, as you may have heard by now. Scientists refer to this vicious cycle as a positive feedback loop. As things currently stand, the methane fountains are too small to have a global impact, but as the Siberian permafrost undergoes noticeable thawing, it seems as if this effect is inevitable. New Zealand Mermaid In 2014, a crew of seven fishermen from Papua New Guinea were fishing on the east coast of South Island in New Zealand right after a big storm. They landed on the sand and saw something lying there. It looked like human remains. Perhaps they had come across the remains of a crime victim or someone who had died in an accident. They contacted local authorities and the New Zealand Coast Guard then called in the federal police for help. After some investigation, it looked like the skeletal remains were not human. Still uncertain about what they were dealing with, they asked forensic anthropological experts at the University of Auckland to try to identify it. Was this an aquatic humanoid or mermaid skeleton? Could the discovery be tied to the Maori legend of Pania, a mermaid who was said to live off the coast of New Zealand's North Island? After falling in love with a Maori chief named Karitoki, they were married. Pania lived with him at night, but in the morning, the sea people would call to her and she would spend 
her days in the sea. Her husband grew tired of this and tried to get her to stay, but if she did, she would die. The only way to get her to stay would be to feed her cooked food. He tried to sneak it to her, but she was warned by an owl, and horrified at the betrayal, she returned to the sea and was never seen again. Some think that she was transformed into the reef at Napier Breakwater and became a legend to locals who believe in the ocean-dwelling creature. Hebrides Mermaid Scotland is full of mysterious creatures, and there are many stories about mermaids. In the early 1800s, some workers were cutting seaweed on the outer Hebrides Islands when they spotted a creature in the water that was described as a woman in miniature. They tried to catch the creature, but she got away. A little boy with really good aim threw a rock at her and hit her in the back. She cried out in pain and disappeared beneath the waves. A few days later, a creature with long, shiny, dark hair and the lower body of a fish supposedly washed up on shore. Everyone agreed it was a mermaid. The local sheriff came and had a coffin brought to the beach. The mermaid was buried in the nearby churchyard. The funeral was said to be one of the largest attended on the island, but there is no grave marker, so the location of what is now known as the Hebridean mermaid is lost. In 1833, Dr. Robert Hamilton, a professor of natural history at Edinburgh University, reported some local fishermen had captured a creature with the face of a monkey, the torso of a woman, and the tail of a dogfish, which they later released. Other mermaid stories have been told around the islands as well. One man reported seeing what he believed to be an otter near the shore. He was about to shoot it, but checked through a telescope first. It looked like it was a woman holding a baby in the water, but she saw him and they disappeared beneath the waves. What do you think these creatures were? Let me know in the comments below. Mami Wata Legend goes that a fisherman from Nigeria had the same routine every day. He would wake up early, have breakfast with his wife, and go fishing. He would almost always catch something within the first hour. But one day, things changed. He was out there a long time, waiting and waiting. Everything was still. The waves, the current, not even a breeze. He sighed and said, it will be a long day. He threw his line into the water one last time and felt a tug. He pulled and pulled with all his might, thinking, what a big fish. But instead of a fish, it was a woman with long black hair and a beautiful face. She was alive and looking at him. He reached for her hand as a sea snake appeared behind her, but as he pulled, he fell into the water instead, and he realized that her bottom half was that of a fish with a red and white tail. This was the Mamiwata, the water spirit. Mamiwata is a water spirit celebrated in Africa. She wears a green snake that wraps around her body, signifying wisdom, rebirth, creativity, healing, and immortality. She is both good and evil, bringing good fortune or death, gifts or disease. She will sometimes bless you or kidnap you, and you never know until it's too late. It all depends on luck. The fisherman realized it was her, and she grabbed him and carried him back to the boat. He sang her a song as an offering, and soon she was gone, leaving behind a mirror and a brush. The next morning, he awoke to his wife screaming. He jumped up, rushing with a machete. What's wrong? She showed him an envelope full of money. This time, the sighting of the Mamiwata had been a blessing. It's shout out time! Big thank you to Shahina Karyakaran, who loves the videos, and Dave Woods, who gave us five stars. Be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell if you haven't already. The Fiji Mermaid Mermaid fever might still be going on, but in the 1840s, it reached peak levels. The Fiji mermaid was one of several so-called mermaids, but they were anything but beautiful. They were half ape, half fish creatures. The famous Fiji mermaid had the head of an orangutan and the tail of a salmon. The mermaid was most likely created by a Japanese fisherman as a joke, although others believe these types of figures were used in some religious practices. A Dutch merchant purchased this mermaid in 1810, as the Dutch were the only people allowed to trade with Japan. When trade routes opened up, many more fake mermaids started to appear in Europe. The Dutch ship sank, but everyone, including the mermaid, was rescued by an American captain, who was so fascinated by the mermaid that he sold his ship and bought it from the Dutch merchant for $6,000. To make his money back, he started charging people to see it and made enough money to make his way to London. He seems to have believed that the mermaid was actually real, and many publications backed him up. Over time, it made its way to the hands of P.T. Barnum, who had just purchased a museum, and came up with a story to promote the mermaid around the world. P.T. Barnum was an American showman famous for promoting the sensational and the bizarre. You have to remember that during this time, the 1800s, many new species of animals were being discovered, so an ugly mermaid might not have seemed so far-fetched. P.T. Barnum went on to found Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. 
Warsaw, Poland If you have ever been to Warsaw, Poland, you might have noticed that in a few places in Old Town or close to the river, there are sculptures of a beautiful mermaid, and her image has become the symbol of the Polish capital. But how did she come to be here? Sirena, or Sirenka as she is called, has been important to the city for a very long time. She was already on a royal seal dating back to 1390. Legend goes that two mermaid sisters were swimming in the Baltic Sea. After falling in love with the landscape, one of the mermaid sisters swam down the Vistula River and decided to stay there. After a few days, some fishermen started noticing strange activity in the water. Something was tampering with their nets, so they teamed up to find what it was. They came upon the mermaid singing and were all enchanted with her beauty, all except for one, a greedy merchant who wanted to capture her and show her off for profit. He kidnapped her and locked her in a shed where she spent her days crying and wailing a haunting song. One of the young fishermen heard her and made it his mission to release her. He got together some townspeople and hatched a plan. In gratitude, the mermaid promised to keep the city and its people safe whenever they needed it. As a way to protect Warsaw, she started wearing a sword and shield, becoming an important symbol and was memorialized and celebrated. Another story goes that Prince Casimirs was hunting one night in the marshlands and got lost. A mermaid emerged from the water and guided him to safety by firing burning arrows into the sky. Out of gratitude, he made made the mermaid the emblem of the city. Regardless of the story, Warsaw is lucky to count with the support of mermaids. The Mermaid of Kiryat Yam In the area of Kiryat Yam, a city in northern Israel, a number of mermaid sightings in 2009 spurred on a search for the mythical creature. After multiple accounts surfaced of people supposedly sighting mermaids off the coast, the local town council offered a $1 million reward to anyone who could bring proof the creature existed. Seen only in the evening at sunset, the sea nymph continued to attract crowds of people with cameras hoping to catch a glimpse of the half-girl, half-fish. Some had reported that the mermaid looked like a young woman and would jump in the water and do tricks like a dolphin for onlookers. While the reward money might seem like a publicity stunt, town council members denied this, saying that they were motivated by the chance to nurture the mermaid as a way to bring more tourists to the area. If someone really did get a picture of a mermaid, tourism alone would make the town way more than $1 million. One resident described seeing the creature when he and some friends were hanging out on the beach and saw a woman lying in the sand. Noting the strange way she was sitting, they approached her, only to have her jump into the water showing off her supposed tail. Stories of mermaids are common for areas surrounded by water and from seafaring people who claim to see this strange hybrid of human and fish. What is it that people are seeing? What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. La Sirene Known in the Caribbean islands, La Sirene is a mermaid who has a sister called La Baleine, who is a whale. She is the Haitian goddess of the sea and reigns over the ocean. Her sister, the whale, symbolizes the boundary between our world and the underwater world. Usually shown holding a mirror or pearls, La Sirene is a blending of African and European mermaid tales with Caribbean culture. In Haiti, she is part of the voodoo religion, with many of her followers calling to her during voodoo ceremonies. Some even believe her spirit can enter the body of female followers and bring them luck, wealth, good health, and love. She brings love and success, but can also be violent and is associated with death. She will also steal children and take them to her underwater palace. Followers of La Sirene say she takes them to her world underwater from anywhere between three days and three years, where she instills new powers in them, returning them to land as a voodoo priestess. The Big Island Mermaid Hawaii has several legends about mermaids, and I mean, if you were a mermaid, wouldn't you want to live in Hawaii? Mermaid sightings have been reported off the Big Island for over 50 years. A group of divers went out to explore the ocean floor and got the surprise of a lifetime. They claim to have photographic evidence of the mermaid. The boat's dive master Jeff Liker took his tour group out to the Kona coast when a school of dolphins started following the boat. When one of the men on the boat started yelling, Liker turned and spotted what he believed to be a nude woman in the water with long flowing hair and a beautiful face. After she leapt into the air, he saw that her lower half was covered in scales and tapered into a huge fish tail. The others on the boat also saw the creature before it dove underwater. But that initial sighting wasn't the only one they had that day. Later, when they got to their destination, Liker was photographing fish underwater when something swam past him. He turned and aimed his camera at the creature, capturing a distinctive mermaid figure swimming above him. To have such a clear photo is quite the feat for an elusive creature such as a mermaid. So do you believe the photo is real? Or maybe a swimmer with a really good costume? Whether the Kaiwi Point mermaid is real or not, locals and visitors to Hawaii's Big Island still believe in the half-woman, half-fish. 
British Columbia Mermaid In the summer of 1967, a mermaid was reportedly spotted on Maine Island on Canada's west coast. In an early evening in June, the creature was seen by ferry passengers in the Active Pass Strait that separates the island in the north from the southern Gulf Islands. A number of witnesses said the mermaid had a large fish in her hand that she supposedly took a bite from. They also said that she seemed to enjoy the surf washing over her. A number of onlookers took photos with the local newspaper offering a $25,000 reward for whomever could provide photographic evidence. Unfortunately, this story has been debunked by the mermaid herself. After a local columnist was told the name of someone who might be able to shed some light on the incident, he ended up finding the so-called mermaid. Judy Allred. One of her acquaintances came up with the idea that a mermaid sighting could promote a fishing derby. Allred agreed to wear a costume and sit on Main Island where she was supposed to wait for two ferries to pass. While waiting, Allred was almost pulled under by the backwash from the ferries. Luckily, she managed to stay there long enough for tourists to snap some photos, and thus the legend of the Main Island mermaid was born, continuing on to this day. Columbus's Mermaids One of the earliest reports of mermaid sightings comes from Italian explorer Christopher Columbus who described seeing the creatures while sailing near the Dominican Republic. He said they were not half as beautiful as they are painted. Six months before his sighting, Columbus set sail from Spain across the Atlantic Ocean in search of a western route to Asia. Instead of finding that route, he found America, and while sailing off the coast, he spotted what he believed to be the mythical mermaid. Describing them as having a human appearance in their faces, he said they were able to elevate themselves above the surface of the sea. Did he see manatees and not mermaids? It seems strange that Columbus would mistake these slow-moving sea cows for a mermaid. Could being at sea for so long have made him see things? Manatees can range from 8 to 13 feet in length and can weigh between 400 to 1300 pounds. Maybe the loneliness of the sea voyage led Columbus to believe he had seen a sea maiden. Could Columbus have mistaken the large sea animals for the half-female, half-fish goddess known as a Targatis by the ancient Babylonians? Or could he have borrowed from the ancient Greeks, whose goddess Aphrodite is believed to have been inspiration for the myths of mermaids as sirens who lured men to a watery grave? No one can know for sure, but it is obvious that long stretches at sea can not only cause hallucinations, but also tall tales, even from infamous world explorers. Thanks for watching! Which mermaid was your favorite? Let me know in the comments below! Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time! Bye!